So we're going to start our first panel, and the topic is the theoretical approach to assessing the impact of PSOB standards. Um, but before we get, begin, I'd like to give my fellow panelists the opportunity to introduce themselves. And so I'll start, I'll turn with, to, to Zilvana. Um, Zilvana Palmrose, I'm a emeritus professor from the University of Southern California and retired for the second time from U of W recently. <laughs> <laughs> And on Tuesday, Zovana yeah. will be inducted into the Accounting Hall of Fame. So let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> I'm Dave Sullivan from Deloitte & Touche. I'm, I'm currently the senior advisor to the CEO on quality and um, up until recently ran the Professional Practice Network or the National Office for Deloitte. I'm Sarah Lord. I'm with RSM. I've currently the National Director of Assurance Services, so I lead all of our audit tools, training, methodology, as well as innovation. And I'm um, happy to be here as a member of CAQ, uh, Professional Practice Executive Committee, and the CAC. I'm Christian Peo. I'm from KPMG. I work out of our national office, and right now I am in charge of the project to rewrite our firm methodology and the tools that go with it. Great, so as you can see, we have quite a distinguished panel here, and I, I keep joking that my, my objective is to stay out of their way. So we'll see, we'll see how, I, how I accomplish that. Um, if we, we have a, a quick slide, and I, I thought I'd take just a minute or two to talk about the PCOB standard setting process. And one of the things I think is important to understand is we've put it into three buckets, but I would say that this is very iterative, meaning that activities in any one of these categories can then inform any other part of the standard setting process. And so while we've drawn it in a little bit of a straight line, as those that are familiar with the PCB standard setting process knows, there's a lot of interaction. So the, the first bucket deals with understanding current and emerging audit issues, and they accomplish that through a number of ways. And, and this is really a staff-led process where they try to understand what are the challenges that are out there today. They do that in a number of different ways. They, they have what's called the Standing Advisory Group, which we'll talk about a little later. They have an Investor advi Advisory Committee, which they utilize. They, they interact with the firms. They interact with the SEC and the FASB. And they interact with a wide range of stakeholders. And so that's one of the things that we're going we're gonna to talk about. So to the extent that the PCOB decides that there's an emerging issue that needs to be dealt, and that um, issue can be long-term, short-term, it'll then move over into the research agenda phase. And, and that's where they start really building out the issue and understanding the issue and thinking about the challenges that exist and really start to formulate regulatory responses. And, and, and this standard setting process really can result in a number of different things that we'll touch on. It can, it can result in formal standard setting, but it can also result in other things like staff guidance. And so um, they, they do have a number of different options available to them from a regulatory response. Once the research phase is complete and the staff makes a recommendation to the board, and then the board decides whether they want to take the project up or not, and, and like I said, that can be staff guidance or it can be formal standard setting. They'll then follow a, a process that is, um, it's very similar to the FASB and the PCOB. The, the staff will draft a proposing release. The proposing release will get exposed. During the exposure period, there'll be a lot of back and forth amongst a number of standard or stakeholders. They'll get comments, both formal, informal. They'll consider the comments, and then they'll make a determination on whether to, to finalize the project. Um, little quirk with the PCOB, because of Sarbanes-Oxley, the, the SEC has to formally approve any final rulemaking, and I'd say they informally approve any staff guidance. Um, and that is a process where they also go through public comment and, and um, seek feedback. So real high level, two minutes on the process, and I think now it's time, good time to start digging into the process. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, with you, Dave. Great. You know, when I, when I look at your career, you've had a number of times when you can interact with the PCOB in a number of different ways. And I guess I'd like to start with just getting your observations on the interactions with the staff, in particular at the, at, I'll say the research or pre-research phase, and you know, maybe give us one or two examples of, of the feedback and how it's gone and, and you know, how we've learned from that process. Sure, sure, happy to. 
Um, and as I talk about this, I, I'd want to put it into the context that the, the PCAOB has a history of, of gathering uh, feedback from different stakeholders, and, and I think the, their new strategic plan has really re-emphasized or maybe emphasized it more than it ever has been emphasized before, that they're committed to engaging with all of the stakeholders in the ecosystem uh, as, they're, as they're doing all of their job, not just standard setting, but inspections and, and uh, all those things that they're being as useful as they can be. So that, I think that that's a really positive uh, a development. I, w I wanna give just quickly uh, a, a few examples, but they, I promise they'll be quick. Um, a few examples where, where we've engaged with the PCAOB um, and one of them is, is pretty historical. In fact, Silvana, it probably goes back to your days when you were at the SEC, when after AS2 was implemented and, and uh, you know, there was concern that it was, it was way too detail-oriented and not a top-down approach, that there was a, a lot of feedback that was gathered in the process of developing what then became AS5 in a top-down approach. Um, and so I, I think that's an example where, where if something goes out, you know, the, you know, these things are not, there's no way to know it's perfect or it's never perfect, right? But it, 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 that it's gonna be useful until you start implementing it and inspecting it. And then once you do that, it's time to make tweaks. And I, I think that that was a good example of that. On the auditor reporting, I know we'll talk about CAMS this afternoon, but, but specifically the issue of the um, audit partner and the disclosure of the audit partner's name um, associated with the engagement, there was a lot of dialogue back and forth between the PCAOB staff and, and, and us about options on where that could be. As you know, in, in some jurisdictions, it's in the auditor's report. The, um, you know, a, as a result of all of that dialogue, the PCAOB decided on their database where they've got the, all of the um, auditor's names and the the names of those firms that participated. And I think, the, I think it was really the, um, the process of gathering that feedback that drove some of the conclusions that were reached. And then more recently, and this is not something, it's still on the research agenda, it hasn't moved to standard setting, um, but more recently we've had a lot of conversations as recently as last week about data and technology, that area on the research agenda, uh, mostly about the use of data analytics in the, um, in the execution of the audit, but also, you know, last week we were talking about blockchain and some of the issues that, that arise in addressing some of the assertions when you're using a public blockchain and that sort of thing. So I think there's a, there are a number of examples where, where that dialogue has, um, has been helpful and, and I think, you know, I think it's all been very useful. Great, so Sarah, there's, um you know, we've talked about a number of different stakeholders and in, in, in how they interact with the PCOB. I guess I'd be interested in your perspective, maybe drilling down specifically to the firms and how does the, what ways does the PCOB interact with the firms and maybe you could provide us with an example or two where that's worked well. Yep, absolutely, and so, you know, one thing we have seen is an evolution in that over the duration of the PCOB and particularly in the last year with some of the changes with the board, um, as they've talked about a little bit, there has been more outreach more discussion in the pre-issue or pre-effective stages of the standards, which has been very helpful, but it does go back a lot longer than that. So when we think back to when the first staff consultation paper came out for auditing estimates, we all provided comment letters on it, and the staff, the OCA brought, I'm sorry, the Office of the Chief Accountant, brought in a lot of the firms for just informal discussions to say, okay, you said this in your comment letter, you know, what did you really mean? Help us understand it. What I thought was particularly effective about some of those discussions is we, you know, we would get into the, hey, you know, we think this might be a good idea, and then would hear the, okay, we, you know, we maybe agree, but here's why that would be hard, or here's why the SEC's mandate um, would maybe not allow that, and have that dialogue back and forth to really understand and help really be thinking through together some of the different challenges. When we think forward to, you know, um, the quality control standards that are yet to come. Um, the IAASB has their exposure draft out, it's on the PCOB's agenda. That's one where each of the firms has a different cadence, but we'll meet with the PCOB board. And in our latest meeting with the board, that was something the board raised to the leadership of the firms to say, what do you think? Now we're not, we're still in the research phase. We haven't issued an exposure draft yet. We haven't issued the formal consultation paper recently, which we might do. What are your, what's your advice? What are your thoughts for the PCOB? So it's not only the interaction at the, at the staff level or the, or the chief accountant level, it's also interaction directly with the boards and the leaders of the firm. 
you know, Paul, if I could just add to that, they, you know, on Friday, for, if, for people who missed it, on Friday, the PCAOB announced that they're taking that system of quality control and moving it to the standard setting agenda from the research agenda, which I think is the first time that's happened since this new process was put in place several years ago. And um, we had the same experience talking with the board about, about the system of quality control, what we're doing around the IAASB's. Um, proposals and, and preparing for that. Uh, and then also, you know, the inspection teams have been gathering a lot more information from the firm on the system of quality control, all of which can inform that process. Great. Maybe turning to Christian for a moment, um, you know, we've, we've talked about the, the SEC and how they have oversight from a, a formal statutory construct perspective. Uh, as a former fellow in the Office of the Chief Accountant who worked in the, the group that oversees the PCOB on behalf of the Commission, be interested in your perspective in how the SEC staff interacts with the PCOB during this process. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot that the, that the Office of the Chief Accountant does to interact with the PCOB. Um, a lot of it is what Paul had already touched on, um, trying to identify issues just like the PCOB is, almost going parallel and making sure that they understand the issues that might be out there before they become bigger issues. So um, as members of the, of, as a former member of the staff, what the staff often does is they talk with the firms, they talk with the PCOB, they talk with other divisions within, uh, within the SEC, um, follow other standard setters worldwide. I remember one time, it, you know, I was a government employee while I was a, a fellow, but uh, one time I actually had to get up at three in the morning to listen to a webcast from, uh, there was a, a parliament in, the parliament in UK had a committee and they were considering breaking up the firms or doing other things, and I had to get up at three in the morning to listen to those, and that was pretty common. We followed all of the different major standard setters so that we could understand what are the issues going on and how does it impact our particular environment. And it actually gets pretty tricky, too, because, as Paul could speak to this better than I, um, we're the most vibrant market in the world, and so we have to think about not just companies here in the U.S., but also how the SEC regulates foreign private issuers. Um, and companies that are obviously global, uh, may, they might, m might be issuers here in the U.S., domiciled here in the U.S., but how, how those international issues impact them. So there's a lot that the staff does to try to keep on top of the issues. Um, once the PCOB has decided to move something to, to the standard setting agenda, we spend a lot of time with academic papers, with other standards uh, that are written on the subject, so that we can gather as much information as we can as SEC staff members to help the project along. As Paul mentioned, we have to, or the SEC has to actually formally approve whatever rules that the PCOB makes. Um, we try to stay and actually do a really good job, I think, with the PCOB of staying uh, side by side because it's not good for the PCOB, it's not good for the SEC, it's not good for the firms, it's not good for anyone if the PCOB plows forward, passes something, and the SEC says, that's not going to work for us and they don't approve it. So we try to stay very close. Uh, they share drafts with us before, with the SEC staff. I say us as if I'm still there. I've <laughs> been graduated for seven years now. Um, don't worry, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> um, so, you know, we try to, they share drafts with the staff uh, ahead of any public exposure to um, have that collaborative um, feedback. Um, and it's a very interactive process that way. Great, maybe I thought I'd turn to Zavana for a moment. And if you're not aware, Zavana uh, used to work in the office of the chief accountant. She was the deputy chief accountant over professional practice. And as I look out, there's a number of people that used to work for Zavana out in the, <laughs> <laughs> in the audience. And so, um, but you know, one of the things that I give you a lot of credit for is from your time with the staff is, is really emphasizing the academic research. And, and how that can improve standard setting. So maybe you could talk about how the academic community interacts and how academic research can interact with the standard setting process. Surely, because actually from a PCAOB perspective, they're very interested in um, academic research at each stage of this, um, uh, at each stage of this process. For example, the um, PCAOB staff monitors postings um, on SSRN and um, publications in the accounting journals. Uh, also, academics are part of the stakeholders that the PCAOB engages in outreach. As, as many of you know, from attending the April PCAOB auditing section symposium, 
where um, the um, uh, PCOB solicited feedback from the academic community that included its current research projects. Um, these are the current research projects, although it hasn't been, the slide I don't think has been updated for the Friday yeah, event yeah. of moving <laughs> quality control into standard setting. Um, but for those of you who weren't able to attend, these are um, the topics that are on their research agenda uh, in addition to quality control. Um, also, uh, the uh, academics can send along their uh, working papers or published articles uh, to the PCAOB that they think might be relevant. In fact, um, um, Board Member Brown volunteered at the um, symposium to be a, a point of contact for the academic community and was even so gracious as to give us all his email address and his phone number. So um, the PCOB is very interested in academic research at all stages. So if, if we think about the standard setting process, one of the things that is important is economic analysis. And mm -hmm. um, maybe this is something that this group isn't as familiar with in terms of the interplay with economic analysis. And so I thought maybe you could touch on that for a moment. Oh, delighted to do so, um, because now the PCAOB does formally engage in econo economic analysis of their proposed auditing standards. And uh, the commitment to do this started with the Jobs Act of 2012. So let me level set by showing this slide, which um, actually uh, e e explains what um, Jobs says, which is that the PCAOB rules and auditing standards are rules of the board. Um, cannot apply to emerging growth companies, that is EGCs, um, unless the commission determines that it's necessary or appropriate after considering not just investor protection, but economic effects, that is efficiency competition and capital formation. So in order to do this, um, the PCAO, well, th there has to be economic analysis. And to its credit, the PCAOB expanded from economic analysis, just not of EGCs, but what for um, uh, uh, to include the, the effects of a standard more generally. But let me briefly overview how this works, because even though it says that the commission makes this determination, it's at the behest of the SEC. It's actually the PCAOB who conducts um, the economic analysis and documents that consideration when it submits um, its adopted standards to the SEC for approval. But importantly, Jobs does not provide any detail or specificity on how this economic analysis or these economic considerations are supposed to be made. This is the entirety, if, if we've got it right, this is the entirety of what job says in regards to economic analysis. So the conduct of economic analysis actually is based on the PCAOB's own staff guidance, which, which was issued in 2014 as, and is available um, for any of you interested uh, in full on the website. So importantly, what the staff guidance says is that the PCAOB's process for economic analysis should consider four elements need, baseline, alternatives, and then the cost, benefits, and unintended consequences of both the alternatives and the um, actual uh, proposal. So this guidance um, is modeled after that used by the SEC, and so it gives credibility to the, SEC, to the PCOB's process. But that said, economic analysis by the PCOB has evolved over time and it continues to evolve. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little later when we get into the PCAOB's commitment to post-implementation review. But the important point is that since the devil is in the details, um, I think academics can also examine the PCAOB's approach to economic analysis. And this is what Chris Nolder and I tried to do in our June 2018 Accounting Horizons article. Um, but economic analysis, it says economic analysis, but that doesn't mean that the PCOB is only interested in economic-based research. In fact, quite the opposite, because when you think about auditing standards, they're really standards for um, individual behavior, although in, in a team setting. So anyway, economic considerations of PCOB pro proposed standards discuss all types of relevant research. 
and are almost like a survey of the academic literature framed within the context of those um, four elements uh, uh, for consideration. For example, the economic analysis of the PCOB's recently adopted standard on auditing, uh, uh, auditing accounting estimates, including fair value measurements, discusses findings from psychology and JDM research um, related to biases, such as anchoring, confirmation, and familiarity. So they are interested in all types of research that potentially would inform the issues for the standard. Can I ask Silvana a question, Paul? Uh, you're the moderator, so <laughs> I'm asking for permission. You, you get one question. Oh, well. So uh, decide whether this is the right one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to spend it now, and I may come back okay. to you. Uh, Zavana, you mentioned the SEC also has a, you know, a, a mandate for cost benefit mm -hmm. or, or economic analysis. The FASB also does a cost benefit analysis, mm -hmm. although we don't have any. Oh, Christine is here, right? Somewhere. The, the, that seems to be a much higher level, um, you know, sort of analysis that's done there. How how would you compare the PCAOB's process, with, say, with the SEC's process? Well, this is something that actually Chris and I talk about in our paper because the SEC's charge is vast. I mean, they, yeah, yeah. they are really regulating all sorts of, of types of institution and market participants. So their economic analysis is really of market kinds of effects. Um, that said, uh, the, the DIRA staff work, you know, do, just as Christian talked about, the staff in OCA, interact with the, um, uh, the PCOB on standard setting. On economic analysis, there's an interaction too. But I think it's, I, I, I would suggest um, that the economic considerations of auditing standards are different because they do involve standards for individual auditor performance. Right, right. So what Chris and I suggest is what is, is needed is not just high level economic consequences or concepts like moral hazard and asymmetric information, which I mean, information asymmetry may apply more to the SEC in terms of market participants' right. um, use of information you know, in our markets. But unless you're talking about a disclosure standard like HAMS mm -hmm. to investors, we're really not talking about quite the same thing for asymmetric information. So we argue that, um, or suggest, that what we need are principles, our first principles, core principles, for economic considerations of auditing standards. So I, I do think they are different, and I think as, as the process moves along, we'll probably find some refinements that get it, you know, recognize that auditing standards are a little bit different from an economic standpoint. So, and I can see that they're different, and certainly they're different in how they impact the markets mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And it may, be, it may be difficult, if not impossible, to, for example, in the use of estimate standard to, to determine what impact, if any, that had on the capital markets. But, yeah. the, mm -hmm. but, the, yeah. but the approach, I guess you don't, you don't want to get too tied up in the, in, the, in the economic analysis that you can't issue a standard, but you also don't want to just take it for granted that just because you came up with an idea that you should, everybody should do it. Correct, and I, I, I mean, I would, would hope that the economic analysis would be read by everybody and to understand why the um, PCOB made the choices that they made from among the alternatives and why these are the most effective you know, cost benefit effective choices. Right. So that's what I think our goal here is to understand um, um, how those choices were made, how the trade offs were made, and that the, the unintended consequences were considered too. Yeah. So, yeah. Great, thank you. That was a good question. You get another one, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think he had two questions in there, Paul. Right. Yeah. Don't press your luck, though. <laughs> I thought I'd turn to Sarah for a second. And, and we've been talking about the PCOB, but in reality, in the United States, Auditors are subject to three different set of auditing standards. We have the PCOB, we have the IAASB, and we have the AICPA's ASB. Um, how similar are those standards, and, and how do they relate to each other? So that's a great question, and it's something that I think every firm struggles with, <laughs> and every auditor struggles with, because we need to teach people how to do their job. And as Zoe really articulated really well, the standards are implemented by individual people. People as part of teams, as part of a firm, and so, so I am a member currently of the Auditing Standards Board, and the, our mission is to converge with ISAs. And some of the foundation for that comes from the forum of firms. So the major firms are part of that international network. We also have international engagements that we work on. 
where we not only we have public or we have private companies housed in the U.S. with subsidiaries internationally. So we need to be able to make sure that we're executing audits that work across the world. The ASB's mission, as it relates to the PCOB, is to eliminate unnecessary differences. So it is slightly different. It's not the same exact level of convergence, but every standard that the PCOB issues, the ASB looks at and says, okay, how is this different than the public, private company standards? Why is it different and, can, and can, should we be the same? So you will notice just this last year there was an um, issued standards to conform with some of the more recently issued PCOB standards. Um, when you look at that and play that out, then as a firm and as individual auditors, we need to figure out, okay, are these the same or different? So the auditing estimate standards is a really great recent example where the IAASB issued a standard. The PCOB issued a different standard. There are observers on the different task forces, so the PCOB does observe the IAASB and still came to a con conclusion that the U.S. market is different. We don't want the exact same standards. The ASB then looked at that and said, okay, what do we do next? and did an analysis of both standards, fortunately, in my personal opinion, really came to the conclusion that fundamentally, at the end of the day, the goals of the standards are not different. There are words that are different. There are maybe some things that you might explain slightly differently in your methodology, but what you're trying to accomplish is the same. And so we put out an, expo well, I guess it's not out, it's for final, it'll be out in about a month, an exposure draft for the ASB that really largely conforms to the ICES. But with the idea that once this is implemented, you will, we will have one consistent approach to auditing estimates. The PCOB standard has a lot more related to pricing services. There's some areas that are U US specific that are more unique that, that will be looked at by the ASB in the future. But really the goal is to look across all the standards and try to level set and make them as consistent as we can while still looking at there are differences in the needs of investors and users in a private company and a public company. And we need to not forget that. We know we don't have statutory audit rules in the US. Some countries have that, those specific rules, and sometimes they even have different kind of audit requirements for them. We don't have that. So we know if the private company, if they're getting an audit, it's because somebody wants it. It might be investors, it might be lenders, it might be owner managers, it might be that you know it's owned by a family and they want somebody else to come in to make sure everybody's um, playing on level ground. So we do look at that as being slightly different than the a public company user where you have maybe a broad base of investors. Maybe you have pension funds. Maybe you have, you know, in some of our public companies, you know, one owner worth $2 billion. But whatever that is, it is slightly different. So the standard setters do work together. There's a lot of crossover on the different task forces, people that um, provide input into both sets of standard setting, but coming, trying to come together as much as we can, but making sure that each standard setting group is representing the constituents that are most important to them. So even though there's a lot of similarities, it still sounds like it's pretty hard. I mean, Christian, from, from your perspective, how does your firm manage that in terms of having an audit methodology? Because I imagine you don't want people going out into the field and, and having to pick, well, okay, I gotta use this audit methodology this time or this one. So from a firm perspective, how do you manage that? Yeah, it's, it's actually really, really challenging. And even, um, maybe just to follow up on some of the things that Sarah said. So, even when we get the same words, the exact same words, as a global network of firms, someone in Germany, for example, might read those exact same words a very different way. And you know, I guess if you step, take a step back and think about it, of course they're gonna read it a little bit differently. They're from a different country and growing up in a different environment. And so it is very different, um, even if they're the exact same words. Well, then it becomes an even greater challenge when the words are slightly different. Were they meant to be slightly different? Uh, what, how do we execute against that? And if you fast forward to the end, one of the real challenges of the firms is, well, wait a second, it, even if I just think about our PCOB audits and I have a large multinationals where I uh, am going to have to enl enlist the help of lots of member firms around the globe, if they don't have the same idea about what the PCOB standards say, or from their, from their perspective, the FPIs, if, the, if we are not auditing the exact same way, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. If I have to worry about my counterpart, my partner in Germany, auditing the way that I think needs, it needs to be audited, and instead he's thinking about the ISAs instead of the PCOB standards, there's a chance for an audit quality breakdown there. 
So it's a, it's a huge challenge, and I think the way that, um, uh, that at least our firm does, and I think probably it's similar across, but, but um, Dave can talk about that a little bit, is it's a very painstaking exercise to take each standard, and you know the standards really are rules, and so you compare all of the rules, and you figure out, well, what's the exact same? What's a little bit different? Why is it different? And then you build a methodology around that. And even when there are differences in the rules, sometimes you can bridge to come to one methodology. And I think that that's really important, and probably every, everyone here understands that, but there, there's a huge difference between the rules, the standards, and a methodology, right? Because uh, if the standards say, go establish materiality, and that's all it says, and that's consistent across all of the, all of the three sets of standards, uh, the firm still has to set methodology so that it's done consistently across uh, across engagements within a firm and across firms, uh, member firms, um, so that you have one way to set, set materiality. And it's the same with every single rule. Uh, you take the rules and then you have to build a methodology around those rules to consistently apply those. And so a lot of times those differences, even if they're differences in the standards, can be bridged by having one consistent methodology. So I would say probably, hmm, I don't know, uh, Everyone has a different opinion on this. I would say probably the standards are 80% similar, and then you can bridge another 10, 15% through methodology, and then you're going to have some differences that you just have to make sure everyone knows what those differences are, why you have those differences, and make sure that they're addressed appropriately. Great. Paul, could I just add that yes. the um, partners will probably hear from academics during the breakout session that a lack of convergence in the standards too <coughs> creates challenges from an educational st audit education standpoint. Sure, sure. So um, it's, it's certainly been on the radar screen for academics for a long time too. So maybe let's transition a little bit to uh, the next topic. And thought we could spend some time talking about the process the firms use for commenting on proposed PCOB standards. And thought maybe, Sarah, I'd start with you. Um, as, as I think about commenting, I imagine there's a lot of people within your organization that are very anxious to comment on PCOB standards. <laughs> Could you give me an under, or give the audience an idea of, of who all is involved and, and what does it take to reach consensus? Sure. So within the firm, um, and at least I'll talk with RSM and we can, we'll add, ask David and um, Christian to talk about how their firms work as well too, but we'll have one leader. Right, so we have one person that's looking at the standard and has been kind of following it from the beginning. From that research stage, um, typically it's a partner in our professional practice group that has, is a special specialty person in that area. They usually get par paired with a manager, a senior manager, somebody else that can help them um, with a lot of the effort, work effort that goes into it. And then we'll also st reach out and say, who else wants to be involved in this? So it could be some of our um, lead consultants, people that are spending our subject matter experts in that area from across the firm. It can be really most of, I mean, candidly, most of the standards, almost everyone in our audit side of the group gets a little bit involved in, even if it's just reading it or providing some comments. Um, depending on the sensitivity of it, so we do participate in CAQ task forces that will gather information, and, and you know, we're gonna talk about that a little bit coming up too, and how that might be the same or different as what the firm actually puts in our comment letter. Um, and then we'll bring in leadership depending on the, what the topic is. So our CEOs, our governing board members of the CAQ, they're not necessarily um, going to be you know, on a lot of conference calls debating the words and the auditing estimate standards, for example, but they wanna know what's going on. So we're informing them of the major decisions. We're particularly informing if there's anything that is very, very um, controversial, where maybe there's not agreement across the firm, so there's not agreement within our firm on how we would wanna approach something. As it comes to creating consensus within the firm, we definitely do have, you know, we'll start with reading, you know, reading through, providing some comments. There may be situations where somebody says, hey, I think this is good, and somebody else says, hey, I think this is bad, <laughs> and we'll really debate through those. And so I would say that we haven't had a situation where there's ever needed to be like, somebody pulls rank or, you know, makes, hey, this is, I'm gonna, you know, I don't care what you think, this is the right answer. It really gets down to working through, well, what are you reading in it? And one of the things that I particularly think is really important, and you touched on this in your comments about convergence, is when we're reading the standards, I don't always, in the exposure draft part of it, I don't, I try to forget about, even if I've been part of standard setting, or part of drafting it, or part of discussions, 
what the person meant to say versus what is written, it doesn't really matter. Maybe I know, well, this is what I think you mean to say, and I can maybe get there, but a huge part of that exposure draft, that comment letter process, is providing that feedback to say, we're kind of guessing here. This is what we think you mean, and sometimes that will get into specifics of, we'll, we'll draft something, we'll say, maybe say it this way. <laughs> this makes more sense to us, and provide those specific comments back. So when you see the comment letters, and you see those, what may be pages of editorial, it's very rarely editorial. It's usually us trying to go through and understand what's in there and be able to push it back out in a way that people in, in, you know, in the US can all understand it. But then as we think about translating it globally and as we think about other users being able to understand it, providing that feedback. So really, it is collaborative. I mean, there can be some pretty healthy, exciting discussions. I mean, exciting for me, but we've, I've established very often that my idea of what's exciting is not the same as everybody else's, but I feel like this is a room where exciting is the same for a lot of us, and we can have a lot of fun. Um, but usually it doesn't get to being, um, it doesn't get to a place where a firm doesn't agree, but there can be a lot of good discussions along the way. This might be the complete population of people. I think it might be, yeah, yes. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. That's why it's such a special Well, group. there might be yes. some that actually don't find it exciting, even in this yeah. room. <laughs> um, Christian and, and, and Dave, any, from yeah. your firm's perspective, uh, similar, I mean, the same? Uh, very similar. similar. Same I'd, I'd add a few things. I, for any um, significant standard, especially PCAOB standards, because it impacts the global <laughs> practice, not just the US practice, it's a, it's a global effort, not just a US mm -hmm. firm effort. And, and we really try to think about the, um, the impact of the standard on our methodology. While we're, while we're evaluating the exposure draft and, and gathering feedback and that sort of thing. So it's, um, so it, it is a really, it's a collaborative process. It's, it's, it's a really important process. I would say on, any, on anything that, that might be controversial, we try, to, we try to ferret those issues out at, at the beginning and discuss those upfront so that we have, we, we can come up with our firm approach and then let people work on it, not you know, bring that up at the very end of the process and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I would say that the process is pretty similar. And then, and then to the extent that the, um, that, you know, it, it makes sense, we'll also try to, um, to do a dry run on it. So when they, even with the, with the uh, beginning uh, auditor's reporting model, we did dry runs on that. We did dry runs uh, before AF7 was issued and, and tried to anticipate what the impact would be so that, we had, so that we had enough resources to do the things we thought we had to do in order to comply with the standard. Yeah, I might just add, this probably isn't directly responsive to your question, Paul, but that's Sorry. okay. <laughs> 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 I shouldn't say that because you could stop me, but I'll, uh, anyway. Um, I think, uh, at least from my perspective, and I haven't gone back to look at all of the comment letters, but as I've been involved in the comment setting process for a long time, or comment letter process for a long time, I, I think that there's been a change over the last mm, five, seven, maybe even 10 years from the firms, where they've grown to become, they, they, they've grown up a bit and are now used to being a regulated entity by the PCOB. And if you look at some of the early, early comment letters from some of the earliest standards, I think there was a lot of uh, probably not in the words itself, but maybe a little bit in the tone like, PCOB, you're a young organization, you don't know how to set standards, this is how we do it, um, you know, that, that type of, a little bit if you read between the lines. And now I think the, the big challenge for the firms isn't uh, that the PCOB doesn't know what they're doing, they do. We've learned that the PCOB knows what they're doing, the SEC knows what they're doing, they know how to write rules. And so it's a matter of figuring out, okay, uh, like Dave said, how does this impact our methodology? And is this a change, uh, is this a difficult change because um, it's very difficult in practice and it's going to cause problems in practice? Or is it uh, just that it would cause a problem with our methodology? Because if it causes a problem with our methodology, we're not gonna comment on that because that's our problem, right? If it's, no, actually, um, you know, with the audit committee communication standard, you had some things in there, PCOB, that really felt like you were telling the audit committee what to do instead of the auditors what to do. Well, that feels like a problem when we can comment on that. So one of the challenges is to sort of step back and say, okay, we know where the challenges are, but what's the cause of the challenge? Because we're only gonna comment on the ones that, you know, the PCOB's really gonna care about. They don't care about whether it's a challenge for our methodology and shouldn't care about that. So far, we've talked about how individual firms comment. Um, the, the CAQ issues comment letters. 
and um, all the firms are involved. And I guess um, maybe Dave, start with you. Sure. From from your perspective, does, how's that process work? And should a reader of the comment view that as this is a consensus of the audit profession? And and how how should they interpret those comment letters? Well, well, I think the first of all, I think the process that the CAQ does in getting the subject matter experts from the firms together to respond as a profession is, a, is an important process. Um, there, there will be, you know, if we use the 80-20 rule, or, and maybe it's more like 90 or 95-5 or something like that, there'll be many things that we all agree on. We certainly all agree on the fundamental premise that we want to improve audit quality and the, and the standards should be to move us in that direction. It shouldn't create confusion, it shouldn't, you know, increase an expectation gap, those sorts of things. Um, but what I would say is that the, the, the CAQ letter, um, which, which may, um, in the areas that it addresses, may represent sort of a consensus view of, of at least most of the firms represented in the task force. It's important to, you know, for the, the regulators, for the PCOB, the SEC, and others to read the individual firm letters because there will be, there will be areas where we diverge from one another and, and maybe, you know, practical reasons or theoretical reasons for doing that. And so, um, so for example, with the, with the recent um, proposal on, on changing the definition of an accelerated filer to exclude some people from ICFR, the, the uh, this is gross oversimplification, pardon me, but the, but the CAQ letter was not supportive of that proposal. Our letter was supportive of that proposal as, as a practical expedient for that limited number of companies that would be impacted. The thresholds haven't changed in 15 years. If, if the SEC and their oversight of the capital markets thinks that that's useful, we would support that. So, so it isn't, a, you know, but we didn't go into the CAQ group and say we all wrong to, for, you know, voting against this because voting against our view or the, or the SEC's view. Uh, we're certainly very supportive of ICFR and 404B. We think that that part of the reason we don't have the, the drama and the chaos that, you know, is in the UK and, and in so many jurisdictions around the world is because of the positive impact that that has had over the last almost 20 years. And, um, but, but, you know, the, do things need to evolve? You know, we, we thought we would, we should. So you didn't have a big knockout fight over, over those comments? We did not, we okay. did not. <laughs> That's good. Or at least I don't believe we did. I was not in the room though, so. <laughs> no one came you back bloody You could tell me if we, were, if we were so. rude about it, let me know later. Zavanna, turning to you, talking about commenting on proposed standards. I'm, how can the academics get involved? It, well, and is this the right place for them to get involved? Oh, yes, for sure. Academics can, should, and do get involved in um, providing comment on PCAOB proposed um, auditing standards. In fact, the uh, um, auditing section of the AAA has a committee that um, does uh, comment um, formally on um, these, these proposals. And what they do is they actually review the relevant research and um, frame the discussion around the comments that are posed by the PCLB to, in, you know, to, to inform what research, research says about these issues. But um, individual academics can write comment letters as well as you know, um, work with other groups that write comment letters. Um, they, they, uh, I, I want to play off of the example that Dave just gave in terms of the SEC um, uh, proposed amendments on the um, accelerated filers and large accelerated filers because um, even though it's not PCAOB standard, standard setting, it does illustrate the point that academics do participate in the process. Um, in fact, um, several academics wrote in, and uh, Joe Schroeder, who's I think with us today, was one had, with a group of academics who wrote in and commented on the um, proposal. Um, and uh, based on his research and the research of others, um, and explained why they didn't support the, um, PC, the, the SEC's um, proposal. The other academic group that uh, wrote in actually also said, based on their research, they didn't support the proposal and explained why they thought that the SEC's economic analysis section mischaracterized their research. So um, academics can be very useful, I think, in this process. I imagine that might be a little awkward then if they're saying you didn't quote our research right. Well, it was just interesting. <laughs> no, it, I don't think it, it was just interesting to see how it can inform the process. You know, I, I mean, Studies can be interpreted in different yes. ways, and so it's just really nice, I thought, that academics participated to, to, to help sort of calibrate and um, 
provide um, insights. Great. You know, Paul, if I could just add one other thing. We're, it, rightfully so, we've been focusing on the profession and providing feedback, academics, because that's who we are in this room today. But there are certainly a lot of other groups who are impacted by PCOB standard setting, you know, whether it's, whether it's management, audit committees, or investors. And, and, um, and not surprisingly, those groups are not writing a lot of letters often on standards. You know, there were, there were letters on CAMs, so that was more public, and that was, that was something that, that the public would see. But, but often, because of the nature of what we do, maybe it's, it's similar to the economic analysis bit, Silvana, that the, what we do is so specialized and it's sort of the, the black box, right, that, it, that it's difficult for others in the ecosystem to, to knowledgeably weigh in on the estimate standard, for example, or, some, or use of specialists, mm -hmm. for example. Okay, I said, okay, there's two things to that too. One, if you're trying to figure out where the controversy is, in the comment letters, every once in a while, you'll see something that starts with the majority of the task force. That's the key <laughs> phrase that you're looking for. That means there wasn't consensus, so that does happen sometimes, um, if you haven't noticed that already. The other thing I would say is just, you know, and, and this is to just play on what, to further play on what Dave had said, it is so important to get those additional voices in on the comment letter process. And I think sometimes people, um, if you're, if it's an individual academic, if it's a client, when we go to, because we'll have clients call us and be vehemently passionate about something, they'll say, write a comment letter. Oh, it's too hard, or oh, I don't want to do that. When we're working on standard setting, even if, the sta if there's an exposure draft that is 800 pages long, and you're incredibly passionate about one question in there, a comment letter on that one question is helpful. I think sometimes people get this feeling of like, well, you know, there's part of this that is really interesting, or there's part of this that aligns with my research, or with what I teach, or with what I'm good at, the most knowledgeable in, but not all of it. So do I not want to comment? Not at all, right? So look at it and say, where you can add value, or where you have insight or passion, it's absolutely okay to only respond to part of it and just let the rest of it um, be left alone. And I think sometimes people don't always feel, don't always know if that's the right way to go. Great. <clears throat> so we've we've talked about how people are commenting. Now now let's maybe tech, take a step forward, and, and we're at near final, or we're at we're at a final standard. And, and now this is where the rubber is going to meet the road, and, and the firms are going to have to implement this. And 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 Christian, you touched on this a, a little bit, but you know how does your firm think about implementing this standard? What 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 are the things that go into assessing the the implications? once you know that the standard's final or near final um, from the PCAOB? Yeah, so there are a lot of aspects to that question. There's um, how do you train your folks? How do you change your workflow tools? Um, let me focus for just a second on just how we change our methodology. Um, it, is, it is a really easy thing to um, to read a standard and have, I guess, what you would call confirmation bias, mm -hmm. where you read the standard and you say, oh, yeah, our methodology works. We do that. <laughs> right? yeah. um, and that is something I think that, as the firms have matured under being a, by being a regulated entity, that is one of the things that I think has started to uh, um, become less and less, uh, or we focus more and more on making sure that that does not happen. Uh, because it is really dangerous if you just take a new standard and then try to take your new methodology and draw the connection to all of the different requirements in there. Because you are going to miss what the purpose of the standard was and why they made, why they, why the PCOB said certain things, why they wrote things in a certain way. Um, I'll give you a real, a very small example, um, but you can take that small example and see that it gets littered throughout uh, all of a methodology. I mean, the standards are that thick. So if this is one example, you can just times it by a million and, and you can see how quickly things can get out of hand. Um, as we're writing our new methodology, the question came up about the difference between how the PCOB handles uh, or requires the auditor to think about um, having uh, or incorporating elements of unpredictability uh, versus what the ISAs and the AUCs say. So in the PCOB standards, there's more of a general requirement that just says, hey, auditor, you've done all of your risk assessment now. As you take a step back, think about uh, you're, you're required to incorporate an element of unpredictability. It doesn't tell you a whole lot about where or how or when. It just says, based on all the risk assessment that you've done, go incorporate an element of, of unpredictability. 
The ISIS and the AUCs are actually very prescriptive about when you do it. It is based on uh, ISA and AUC 315 and 240. It basically tells you, look, if you find a financial statement level risk that's related to fraud, then you need to incorporate an element of unpredictability. Well, if your standard is, if that's the first standard that came out, and then the PCLB standard comes in, you would say, well, wait a second, I already do this. I already am incorporating an element of unpredictability. No problem. I comply with the PCLB standards. But that's not what the PCLB was saying. They're, telling, they're asking the auditor to think about it more broadly, not just in those particular situations. Otherwise, they would have copied the exact same words that the, that the ISIS and the AUC use. So you have to be really careful about not reading the standards to fit into your methodology, and then, but starting with the standard and block by block, requirement by requirement, activity by activity, changing your methodology to comply with those standards. Yeah, I mean, just my own perspective, I think that's one thing that we've seen in evolution from the firms. I remember when EQR standard, risk assessment standards came out, having discussions with firm leadership, hey, this is everything we already do, and sort of had that confirmation bias that you were talking about. Yeah, and, yeah not thinking through the, wait a minute, we're now going to be inspected on this differently because there was an expectation that people were going to do things differently. And I think if you sort of look through the history, you, you, you see that maybe that assessment by the firms wasn't as robust as it needed to be. And I, I think all of the firms are doing a much better job today in terms of thinking through the process in, in, as the PCOB is proposing standards. But you talked about methodologies. Maybe, Sarah, turning it over to you. I'm, there's got to be other aspects that, that are impacted. Maybe if you could delve into some of those, it'd be great. Sure. So when we look at it, we do need to update the methodology, the tools, the, the manuals, but then we also need to train our auditors on how to do this, right? So it can be training on how to, in your great example, think differently for the whole audit. One of the things that's tricky about that is timing. So a new standard will come out. There's usually 18 to 24 months before it goes live. And so we need to start talking to our auditors about what's going to happen but they're not implementing it yet. So there's this balance of you know, getting ahead, getting in that in information in their mind, getting them thinking about it, not confusing them with what they need to do right now on their audits, and then continuing to build that. So auditor reporting is a great example. That's been a multi-year process, at least you know, in our firm. The first year of training, we focused a lot on the changes to the reporting, disclosure of tenure, and high level said, you know, CAM's coming. Here's what CAM is. At first, you know, or, or three years ago now, it feels like a long time ago. And then you go through and you keep building on it as you get closer and closer into, you know, this last year was, here's how you identify what a CAM is. Here's practice runs on writing a CAM. This summer, again, we, don't, we, don't, we haven't had anybody go live yet. We didn't have the large accelerated filers with the off cycle year end. So we're still this summer again working on, here's how you do CAM. And I have a sneaky suspicion We'll do it again next year, right? After we've been through one year of CAM. So it is, it's building the methodology, but then building that um, framework around it to help the auditors understand how to actually implement it. Because it's the same thing, just as easy as it is for us mm -hmm. to go, yeah, that's close enough. If you just push through some changes into a work program, the auditors are gonna go, oh yeah, I do that. That's and not have to right. think about it. Mm -hmm. yep. so. so so far we've been talking about how the change impacts the audit firms and it's sort of an internal retrospective maybe turning to Dave, you know, CAMS is an obvious example, but I would think a lot of the auditing standards might impact stakeholders outside of the audit firms. Maybe you could touch on how you think about that in terms of communicating with audit clients, with investors. Well, it, it's a great point, and maybe before I do that, just to, to step back a little bit, it, it's, as we look at, at Christian's words, confirmation bias, that's, you know, it's just an issue, right? And you get a new standard, you get the risk assessment standards, and, and we, did, we did exactly what Christian said. We mapped all of our programs and methodology to the risk assessment standards, but continued to get comments and risk assessment and, and PCOB inspections. And so we said, okay, well, that didn't work. How about we go back and revamp our methodology and, and our approach to risk assessment? And, and about four years ago, rolled out a new risk assessment process that, that clearly embraced the, the risk assessment standards and saw the, saw the positive impact from, from that. So, it, so there's a, a great lesson to be learned. I think we, we face the same sort of a challenge on the um, use of estimate standard that, that um, will go into effect next year because as the PCAOB has been inspecting, I think all of the firms have enhanced their methodology beyond what the existing standards had said. 
And so when we have now this, this new final standard, there may be again a confirmation bias that we already, already, de already did it. You know, we're ready, we already did it. And so we're doing what we can to, to resist that urge, to resist that urge on behalf of all of our people as, as they execute audits and that sort of thing. The, um, you know, again, when you think about estimates, the, you know, all of these things that we audit are impact clients, right? They impact management who prepare the preparers of financial statements and that maintain the system of internal control and the audit committee and those charged with governance. And so, um, you know, we, we clearly we get very limited amounts of time with audit committees, so we do not spend, you know, lengthy periods of time discussing proposed auditing standards and that sort of thing. We do make sure that we have those conversations, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with the audit committee chair or with the audit committee, certainly with management where it'll have more of a day-to-day -day impact on the, on the impacts of the changes in the standards and why they're coming and, and that sort of thing. Because it's important as, as we plan for it that they're also planning for it, um, the, that to the extent that this might impact their, their processes, their system of internal control, that they're, they're on top of it. So we wanna make sure we have those discussions early and often. Great. I thought we'd pivot back to you, Savannah, for a moment. And we've, we've talked about firms' implementation, how they make assessments of what the impact's going to be. But one of the things that um, is common in the regulatory environment is that you do post-implementation mm -hmm. review. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the FAF does it for the FASB. The SEC does it sometimes. Sometimes they don't do it. Uh, but the PCOB has, has recently I'll say committed to do it more often and think about it, and that was you know something the SEC instructed them to to really have a robust process. So, thought maybe you could you could talk about that process. Sure, happy to. And the, the, actually, the PCOB has done one post implementation review, and that was of the EQR um, standard. And I, I, th I think it's pretty clear it was a learning process for the PCAOB. Um, it took a long time. Um, involved the collection and analysis of a lot of data. Um, and in December of 2018, last December, the PCAOB made available um, a staff uh, white paper. Uh, it runs to 116 pages, and except for the length, it reads very much like an academic article with lots of data and analyses. So I think it would be of most interest to the academics in the audience. Um, it, it really is, uh, has a lot of information and, and insights. But for um, other stakeholders, the PCAOB issued um, a four-page executive summary of its specific findings on the implementation of the EQR standard. I think it's shown on this slide. Um, and these include that audit quality has improved and that audit firms and reviewers have made changes in their EQR practices although other factors may explain these changes, including, of course, PCOB inspections. Um, however, there's the more general question about learnings um, in terms of the PCAOB's approach to post-implementation review. And in selecting the EQR standard for its first post-implementation re review, the PCAOB selected a standard that was um, uh, promulgated before jobs and had no economic analysis. So the staff said this was a real challenge for doing post-implementation review and um, made the recommendation that the economic analysis in each um, proposed standard should set up its post-implementation review. So I think we should expect um, changes in the economic analysis of future standards in response to this recommendation so that it does set up more clearly the post-implementation review. Um, in addition, though, the staff um, suggested or a learning was that um, the PCAOB consider using phased implementations um, in order to facilitate post-implementation review. And um, as you all know, that's what was done with CAMS. So we do have phased implementation there. And then the PCAOB has committed to doing a post-implementation review um, of the um, auditor reporting standard. And could I just add one thing on, yes. on phased implementation? I, I think probably there's other comments. I just wanna point out from my experience at the SCC on 404B that when you have phased implementation, um, it, may not, it may be less of a risk with auditing standards, particular auditor performance standards, but you do run the risk of having, giving time for, for um, coalitions to form to push back 
against having to implement um, the requirement at all. Um, in, in standard setting and regulation, there's this notion of scalability, and so scaled regulation is important, um, and that's certainly what we tried for at the SEC, and I know that certainly the PCOB is trying for it. But I heard Professor um, Cox, who's a law professor at Duke, say once, um, groups, stakeholders don't necessarily, some stakeholders don't necessarily want scale, they want exemption. So um, <laughs> it's just the risk that you run with when you, ha when you have um, phased implementation. And Paul, but, this is really an important point on the scalability. We didn't talk about it when, when we talked about methodology necessarily, but it's, but the, but you know, scaling the extent of work that we do, depending on not only the risk associated with it, but the the entity, the size, the, whether it's a PCOB entity and the ICPA audit and so forth, and uh, you know, that just that uh, you know, in, a, in addition to everything else that we talked about, adds to the complexity of of, of rolling out uh, any of these new standards. But scalability, if I think about it, scalability is different than a phased implementation. Absolutely. A scalability Absolutely. is everyone applies it today, but you can, you, you can pull different you levers do do. in terms right. of the application. Right. Phased is, I don't do anything. Yeah, the point I was making simply is that when you try to argue that everybody should do a rule or a standard because it's scalable, right. you give time for phased implementation you give time for coalitions to form and say, yeah, yeah, uh -uh, yeah. uh you know, scalability doesn't work here in a cost benefit way. We need to be exempted. So there are different concepts, but they're conflated um, um, yeah, at yeah. times in the regulatory space. So you brought up phased implementation. Thought I'd turn to Christian. We've we've got one live where we have phased implementation. How's your firm thinking about it and, and, and so far what's the reaction? Is it working, not working? Yeah, I think in general it's working. Uh, I would add to um, those comments of Dave and Zavana that uh, the other challenge, I think, maybe it's a lesser challenge than the ones that you, that you just brought up, but the other challenge is just, man, if you talk about one standard for a long period of time, you get really bored of it. And if you get <laughs> bored of something, then are you really going to be able to implement it the way that you need to? And it's not just the people you know, doing the audits that get bored of it. Everyone in the national office is like, oh my gosh, are we talking about CAMS again? You gotta be <laughs> kidding me. So there, there is a danger of stretching out too long uh, just from a pure boredom standpoint, I guess. And maybe that's not real, maybe that's just in, in my head, but that, that, that feels like a problem to me. That said, uh, I think that the CAMS in particular was probably a really good one to have a phased approach. It was also probably a really good one to have a June 30th year end. I think those June 30 clients are usually the ones that benefit from having, you know, seeing how everyone else adopts something. Uh, but it's a lot of people that are adopting it at 1231. So by having a June 30 year end as well as a phased adoption, uh, we get to see as a firm uh, how to implement this in a controlled manner uh, that meets the standards but still is, uh, you know, follows through firm system of quality controls on just a fairly, relatively small subset of clients, see what the other firms do also, right, right. and then make some changes before we hit the big 930 and then the really big 1231. So I, th I think that it's been working pretty well so far. Uh, the only thing I'd add is I think that, it, that a reporting standard like CAMS was perfect yeah. for a phased implementation. For a performance standard like estimates, you know, I don't know that, that uh, it, you know, having yet another methodology that we're trying to get people to adhere to would makes a lot of sense. So I, I think you, know, you have to look at these you know, individually when you're making those kinds of conclusions. I think that's right. I think it's, it's very hard to come up with how you phase it in, too, for right, a performance right. standard. I mean, it <laughs> simply right. can't be the June 30th, yeah. you know, and, and even accelerate, well, it can't, even accelerated, non-accelerated doesn't yeah. work. Maybe no. try annually inspected and um, annually inspected, but that doesn't work for the firms. I mean, it, that might work for the firms, but maybe. Yeah, and the firms don't like that either, right? Because then they have to train two different methodologies, right. and you have right. people that are working on the non-accelerated filers, and they switch then to an accelerated filer, and right. so then they have to right. keep two, it just right. does right. not work that part. Yeah, I, I initially read this recommendation and thought this is something more that would an, an academic would recommend <laughs> rather than an auditor, um, but um, the CAMS is a perfect one to, yeah. to yeah, think about no, it was, it's, it's a disclosure a, standard yeah, that you could actually great. do it yeah. right. really well. And I think it's important we, when we talk about the phase and we kind of forget already 
auditor reporting had two big phase ins. We had the kind of the quote unquote easy stuff that we found out wasn't quite as easy as we thought it was going to be with tenure and just the change to the report. And then we had CAMS. And so we had that separation there that was really actually helpful, I think, because we got through some of the what was meant to be easier. And then we got to had more time for CAMS. And you know, speaking from the I mean, my vantage point is the middle market a little bit more. A lot of the investors who are the most vocal and the most excited about CAMS are aligned with the accelerated filers. And having that phase in for them to go first and to really get, we have the, you know, we're not, it's not like we can do all the post implementation review on, you know, as it's happening, but we're getting that. We're going to get investor feedback on some of the bigger clients. And so we have time for, I mean, I guess candidly, in my opinion, some of the clients where maybe there's not as vocal of an investor group clamoring for CAM. To, for us to be able to, as a profession, figure out, okay, here's what this looks like, here's what, how we can do this well, and do this efficiently, and do this in a way that's meaningful to our clients, and have time to do that. Well, we're figuring out, you know, we haven't, I don't think I haven't, I've read a little, I haven't seen anything huge blow up over the weekend since Microsoft went live, <laughs> um, you know, but just saying, you know, are we getting a lot of feedback? What does that look like? And we can respond to that. So I think, that, I, I agree, performance standards are really hard, but I think this one is a really great approach. Right. So we're, we're getting towards the end. I thought maybe we could take a pause. I've got more questions if I need to, but um, see if there's any questions from the audience. So if, if you've got a question for any of our panelists, um, just raise your hand. There's a, there's a microphone. Well, usually the first question is from Sobrana, but she's up on the <laughs> right. hand. Yeah. <laughs> so, so somebody's going to have to They're fill in. They're just waiting for you to have more data. <laughs> there's a question. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we have standards and then we have a lot of regulators around the world that choose to interpret standards. So maybe you guys could all reflect upon how you deal with the regulatory environments where you supposedly have three sets of standards, but really 50 different countries trying to interpret that. You know, Dan, I'll, I'll start with the, just a couple of comments and happy to hear what others have to say. Uh, you know, Dan, what you're saying is, is absolutely right, that, the, that in addition to the different standards, the different regulators will set certain expectations in their market that, you know, that there need to be a certain number of significant risks or you have to do a certain type of testing and revenue or, or what have you. And, um, and so that adds to the complexity when you're setting a global methodology. You don't want to, you don't want to burden every jurisdiction with each jurisdiction's preferences. But you've got to manage those so that in each jurisdiction you're performing not only a high quality audit but one that meets the expectations of that standard setter. And so it is, um, it, it just adds to the Rubik's Cube of setting methodology when you've got several different standard setters, you've got, you know, 50 regulators who can interpret those in different ways. And then you've got different size clients and, and different markets and risks associated with those that you have to perform against. So, um, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know if that's a, not a great answer other than to affirm what you're saying. And Dan, I know you and I live it every day. Yeah. But, All right. um, I don't have a better answer than that <laughs> other than to, to observe the same thing. It is, it is very difficult for our firms to handle all of that. And it really becomes, even though you have a broad set of principles to try to apply to, to um, make decisions, it really comes down to a lot of pick and shovel work, making sure that you have the right information coming from all of those different regulators and having knowledgeable people be able to make decisions about are we going to have, are we going to force a consistent answer or are we going to allow some jurisdictional differences? And yeah, you have principles uh, underlying those, but really a lot of times it's a case by case basis. It, it's, it's hard to stay on top of. Question in the back. So uh, I'm Mark from Illinois. I was curious about what your, the panelists thought about where standards would be today if you didn't have a regulator like the PCAOB. Because at a big picture level, I wonder how many of the innovations that we've seen come through the regulator at the PCAOB versus in the IAASB. Um, so what, where would we have been? And then more generally, like if you think about a change that you think needs to be made in order to improve audit quality, when do you start working within your firm's methodology primarily through the CAQ and talking to other firms? Or when do you start thinking maybe there's ever, ever, ever an opportunity to see standards change from the profession 
bubbling up to the to the to the regulator as opposed to from a regulator now. Just I'm curious about other me methods of improving on a quality side standards. You know, I, I, sorry, I don't want to. Go ahead. Go first every time here, but a, a couple of things. First of all, um, well, one, I'm not going to paint a picture of the movie "It's a Wonderful Life" if there wasn't a PCAOB, because in fact, the, the, the PCAOB is is an important part of Sarbanes-Oxley. You know, and I mentioned the benefits of Sarbanes-Oxley before. One of the big benefits of Sarbanes-Oxley is having an effective regulator for the profession, so that the profession keeps its eye on the ball and keeps investors first as they're thinking about. Um, audit, executing audits, setting methodology, and 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 uh, and all of that. So, so you know, pure speculation where we'd be if there wasn't a PCAOB. But that, but it's also you know not the world that we live in. I think the I, I think more importantly is the second question. And if I go back to like the data analytics example and what what the the firms and the profession are doing, we 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 don't. Uh, well, we certainly have spent a good, good number of years, probably in the early years of the PCAOB, just making sure we had our audit methodology and execution up to snuff. Um, but once, once you sort of get that, you know, I, I don't know if under control is the right word, but, the, but once, you, once you sort of get an even keel there, we're, we're like every other um, organization in America looking at ways to utilize technology and techniques and, and current thinking, current, current academic research and sampling and those sorts of things to do an even more effective and efficient job in executing the audit. So I think, I think the, um, the, you know, the, the, the amounts of money that the firms are spending on data technology, data analytics is an example of the innovation continues to happen and, and frankly, in the discussions we've had with the Office of the Chief Auditor, um, you know, we think the approach they've taken is completely appropriate. Continue to observe what the, the innovation that's going on. Let's understand where the current standards might be an impediment and, and talk about how we might evolve those. But let's not rush into standard setting into an area that where there's a lot of innovation and a lot of evolution where you might come up with a standard that you know applies to the technology from two years ago when you issued the exposure draft, but it won't it won't address where things are still going. So, I think the current approach is 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 working well, um, as long as we continue to have that open dialogue about where the standards may inhibit the innovation and the use of technology as we look at the audit of the future. You know, one of the things that. Uh, we've mentioned, uh, not explicitly, but it was sort of underlying all of the comments that we've made about the PCOB and the post-implementation reviews and how they uh, see how we um, implement their standards is they have an inspection arm and uh, that is something that uh, is a challenge for the firms because it's a very stressful process for our people, but it is absolutely the right thing to have. Uh, and really helps drive a lot of the changes that have that have been in the profession uh, that, that that the PCOB has driven in the profession for the last 15 years. So that that inspection process is uh, or was very unique when it first came out for SOX, and there's lots of regulators around the world who have tried to model after it. But it's a really important aspect. So without that, without the PCOB, I think we would not be nearly as advanced in audit quality as we as we have as we are now. Could, could I just add a little bit more to these comments? And that's that, um, I, this reveals um, age, but the panel on audit effectiveness back in 2000 um, made a number of recommendations, and one of them was to have standard setting and um, uh, uh, the, the, the um, oversight of the profession have the, the arms of standard setting, um, uh, back then it was peer review, but inspection and um, enforcement under one umbrella so that there would be a feedback loop amongst them. It, so that there should be an important feedback loop from inspections into standard setting. And I think that's one of the challenges that the, the PCOB is working on now is to get some transparency into that process. You know, the root cause, do root cause analysis in terms of, from the perspective of auditing standards on inspection results. So where can we improve or change auditing standards given what we learn from the inspection process? Because standards are a floor, you know, they're, they're not a ceiling, they're a floor. And so I think that that just is, is one where we just don't have much transparency on how that feeds into 
um, the actual specifics of thinking about standards. Yeah, and it sounds like you have more to say, but let me just interrupt. So I think that that's actually really important that, that the PCOB is now going to focus on writing different standards for quality controls, because mm -hmm. I think as you sort of pull that string a little mm -hmm. bit, What's happening is the PCLB is trying to do a better root cause analysis. That means the firms have to do a better root cause analysis, which when they try to go do that, they say, well, wait a second. Maybe I, maybe I don't have my system of quality controls as well documented and as well running as I thought I did. Otherwise, I would already have a really good root cause. I could point to exactly what failed every time. And so it, you keep pulling it, and it, it does feel like a pretty good feedback process. And there, there does need to be some more transparency, but it's, it really starts with the firms. It, yeah. it, okay. 30 one, seconds. 30 seconds. Okay, just one more question. You asked about the PCOB. When we're doing audit innovation and, and audit changes, it's also important. It's not just the standards. It's the investors, and it's the clients. So we can't lose sight of We don't want to create an expectation gap. Because you know, most of our clients were auditors at some point, many of them were auditors, and they understand what we used to do. So as we start going in and doing data analytics, doing different ways of auditing, maybe what is the substantive procedure changes, we need to make sure everybody's understanding what we're doing. So this concept of 95% assurance lives on. And so I think there's a huge aspect with the PCOB, but it's not just between us and the standard setters, not the profession and the standard setters, it really is the whole capital markets. Well, with that, um, we've, we've come to the end. I'm getting signals from the back. <laughs> uh, I'd really like to thank my, 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 the panelists. I thought they did a great job. And um, all of us will be around later today. So if you've got follow-up questions, uh, there's, a couple break, there's a couple breaks that you can ask questions. And um, sounds like we, we have a topic for next year, though. I, I, I feel like this group could have talked a lot more about that <laughs> subject. So maybe we've got the next panel for next year. So. Once again, thanks for all your efforts. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.